This uh, next session is a two-part roundtable discussion with Q&A. Deputy Secretary John Lyons will lead our first roundtable discussion where you will hear from leaders of the Energy and Environment Cabinet as they review their objectives, current issues, and future goals. Represented on the panel are the Department for Environmental Protection, the Department for Natural Resources, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, Office of Kentucky Energy Policy, and Department for Environmental Protection. Welcome everyone. And uh, John, I, I see that your screen is up, so I will turn, uh, turn it all over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, just wanna apologize for the earlier awkward dismount. Had a little medication issue, but I think I've got it taken care of and we're ready to roll. Uh, as Eileen said, this is a Q&A session uh, with some leaders from EEC. Uh, first, we're going to start off with Commissioner Tony Hatton, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, who's going to talk to us about her and polyfluoroalkyl substances, uh, also known as forever chemicals. Uh, following that, we'll have Commissioner Gordon Sloan, Commissioner of the Department for Natural Resources. He's going to talk to us about coal bankruptcies. Next up, we'll have uh, Executive Director Zeb Weiss, uh, Executive Director of the Office of uh, Kentucky Nature Preserves, to give us a little update on our natural areas and uh, impacts that uh, COVID may have had there. Uh, following Zeb will be Kenya Stump, Executive Director of our Office of Energy Policy, talking about uh, Kentucky's energy landscape. And rounding out the panel, we'll have Larry Taylor. He's an environmental scientist consultant senior the Department of Environmental Protection, he is going to discuss environmental justice and how Brownfields plays a role in our envi environmental justice uh, areas. Uh, so first up, Commissioner Hatton, if you can turn on your camera and mic, we'll get started. Thank you, John. Hatton, appreciate... Go ahead, go ahead, Tony. Thank you, I, I really appreciate the Appreciate it, John, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be part of the 44th Annual Governor's Conference. Just real quickly before we get started on this topic, uh, for those of uh, my DEP colleagues who are uh, attending and participating today, I just want to remind you once again uh, how much I appreciate everything you do and what a pleasure and a privilege it is to be a colleague with you here in the department as we do our day-to-day our -day jobs of uh, doing everything that we can to protect public health and the environment. So I want to talk a little bit about PFOS, PER, and polyfluoronated alkyl substances. That's a mouthful. PFOS are not really a brand new issue, um, but still at the same time, when you, you look at the fact that we've been working for the last 40 plus years in the environmental arena in earnest here in, here in the United States, it's still a relatively new issue. Um, PFOS are a, it's an increasingly long list of man-made uh, fluorinated compounds that are used for specific purposes in a number of consumer products, food packaging, uh, industrial lubricants, and a whole host of things. And, uh, you know, PFOS were created for a certain purpose to fit that particular purpose. And the carbine, carbon and fluorine bond that is the basic chemical structure of PFOS is an extremely a uh, strong uh, chemical and physical bond. And because it's a strong bond, it makes it very useful for the purposes for which it was developed. Uh, but it is a very persistent compound, which means it's not easily chemically or physically disaggregated. As a result of the characteristics of this compound, inevitably, when they make their way into environmental media, such as soil and groundwater and sediment and surface water, then once they're there, they do not readily attenuate and they, they have the, the ability, it seems like, unfortunately, um, to migrate readily. And it's at, that's sort of the nexus where DEP really becomes heavily involved in the PFAS issue is potential exposures or exposures of the public or ecological receptors to PFAS that has been um, introduced to environmental media. Um, any environmental media that's been impacted by any hazardous substance, pollutant, or contaminant falls within the bailiwick of the department's authority 
uh, to take certain actions to reduce the effects of those releases and to do whatever we can at, at whatever point in time we are to uh, mitigate the effects of those releases on the public and on the environment. Now, at least initially, that really gets into two significant categories within DEP's purview. One of those is drinking water and surface water issues and concerns. And the second one is sort of the classic Superfund situation where you may have had releases that affect soil and groundwater and potential offsite impacts. So those are the two primary areas, at least initially, where the department has focused its efforts and will probably be the two areas where much of the effort is focused in the not too distant future as things continue to develop. I'm certainly not a toxicologist or epidemiological expert, um, but there are definitely have been documented health effects related to exposures to PFOS. Uh, as I said before, it's very persistent and it tends to accumulate and it's uh, studies have shown that it, that it accumulates in organs like lungs, kidneys, liver, brain tissue. If there weren't some deleterious effects to this, we wouldn't be having the conversation that we're having. So I'm, I'm certain that there's going to be continuing developing science on that, but that's the reason uh, that we're having the conversation. That's the reason why PFOS is considered to be an emerging contaminant. And as Deputy Secretary Lyons mentioned, owing to its persistence, it's commonly also referred to as a forever chemical. Just real quickly, let's look at the, uh, the regulatory or statutory framework related to PFOS. Right now, PFOS and its associated compounds are not regulated under the Clean Air Act. They're currently not regulated under the Clean Water Act or under RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. EPA has issued what's known as a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion. That's a health advisory related to ingestion, which means drinking water, primarily water or fluids that may contain PFOS and associated compounds of 70 parts per trillion. Some states, particularly those states who have significant documented issues with PFOS, releases of PFOS and impacts, direct impacts to the public have established some of their own state specific maximum contaminant levels, reminding everyone that an MCL is sort of a hybrid approach to both a technological and risk based, uh, setting a both technological and risk based number moving forward. Not surprisingly, as with many things, what would be a pr protective number? What should it be? Is an issue of much debate. And as you, as you might expect, uh, we have opinions from ranging from we should have this level set at a part per trillion to opinions that widely vary on the other end of the spectrum. Those are things that I presume and assume are going to be working their way through the process and are now to some degree. Uh, and EPA is yet to set a an MCL. They have yet to establish PFOS as a hazardous substance under CERCLA. Uh, or as a hazardous air pollutant under the Clean Air Act. We'll see how that develops moving forward. In the meantime, we had to ask ourselves within the department, what can we do with the resources that we have, given the newness of this issue, at least to us, and given the lack currently lack of a statutory regulatory framework? So we, much of what we do in the department sort of follows, it's complicated, but it follows a simple calculus. Our simple calculus is, whether it's a permit or cleanup at a UST site, a Superfund site, whatever it might be, is you have a potential source of contaminants, you have a pathway by which those contaminants may migrate uh, in a direction you don't want them to, and then you have to consider what exposures there might be when a contaminant arrives at that place. So it's source, pathway, exposure. Typically, we deal with issues, they begin on the source side, we look at pathways and then potential exposures. In this particular case, because of um, a lack of framework and wanting to apply our limited resources uh, where they were needed most immediately, we decided to start on the far right end of that simple calculus by looking at potential exposures across the Commonwealth. Another thing that's been a big help to us, and I'm very thankful for it, is we have a small lab within the department. Uh, if you were to compare it to a, to a large private lab, it, it may not look like much, but we have really good chemists and we have really good equipment and we have a lot of dedicated people. So over the course of the last uh, year and a half or so, 
we work pretty diligently to to uh, develop our ability to do both potable and non-potable PFAS analysis. And we have been able to do that. We've been able to get certified to do that. And that helps us tremendously because lab capacity and cost is for private labs for PFAS is cost prohibitive for us. So having a plan and the ability to do the analysis, back in the summer of 2019, we, we went across the Commonwealth and did a broad study. We sampled a finished drinking water at 81 water treatment plants across the Commonwealth. We did this in both urban and rural areas. We uh, sampled at both surface water and groundwater sources. Um, we had about 72% detects of at least one PFOS constituent in our surface water, and it was about 26% detects in um, finished water from groundwater sources. I think the word that would most accurately describe the findings of our investigation is that they were encouraging. Uh, about 40, about 50% of the water treatment plants that we sampled were non-detect for PFOS constituents and it has a detection limit of around two parts per trillion. Uh, the great majority of surface water, uh, water treatment plant impacts we saw in terms of surface water and groundwater were along the Ohio River corridor. I do believe that Orsanko is, is uh, going to be launching a, a study of the river here pretty soon themselves. And so we'll be looking forward to that information. From a groundwater perspective, uh, those uh, those facilities impacted were primarily the alluvial aquifer along the Ohio River, the Pennsylvania sandstones over in eastern Kentucky, and the significant aquifers down the Jackson Purchase as part of the Mississippi embayment. Uh, we had much fewer detects in those groundwater systems. There is a report that's available. Let me read it here. It's Evaluation of Kentucky Community Drinking Water for Per and Polyfluoral Alkyl Substances, dated November 18, 2019, and it is available on our website. So this, this past summer, as we continued to implement our strategy, we thought we needed to take a look at source waters. We've looked at drinking water, we're looking at source waters. So we collected 40 surface water samples uh, in our seven major stream watersheds. We are currently evaluating that information and are working on developing a draft report. I can say that 36 of the 40 uh, facilities that we, or surface water samples where we collected samples, uh, we did have the text of PFOS and related compounds. I will say again, for the most part, that information has been encouraging. Uh, and again, we will be uh, issuing a report on that uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, with regards to what our plans are coming up in the future, uh, we will probably very likely double back next summer and do some additional drinking water uh, system evaluations, uh, analyzing those systems for PFOS. And we're also working hard to develop our ability to do uh, fish tissue sampling uh, related to PFOS and potential impacts from those compounds. So, John, that uh, concludes my remarks for the time being. Thank you, Tony. Um, next, uh, we'll have Commissioner Sloan. Commissioner, if you can please uh, activate your camera and mic. Uh, with coal bankruptcies having been in the news recently, how the bankruptcies affected the Department of Natural Resources and the ability to reclaim those mines. Thanks, John. Let's talk about coal bankruptcies. The Department for Natural Resources is currently engaged in eight bankruptcies associated with coal mining operations in the Commonwealth. So those bankruptcies that we're dealing with are Cambrian Holding Company. They filed for bankruptcy in June of 2019 they had uh, 121 permits with a total unreclaimed high wall of over 137,000 linear feet. That's about 26 miles, almost the distance of a marathon. Another major bankruptcy was the uh, Black Jewel and Revelation bankruptcy. They filed just after Cambrian in July of 2019. They had 184 permits with a total unreclaimed high wall of over 123,000 linear feet, again, about 23 miles. Murray Energy filed for bankruptcy late last year. Murray had 31 permits with a total unreclaimed high wall of over 12,000 linear feet. Also, Ember Energy filed this year. They had 18 permits in Kentucky. 
Ember had a total unreclaimed high wall of over 37,000 feet or about seven miles. Rhino Energy, they filed for bankruptcy this year. Rhino had 16 permits with about 14,000 total linear feet of unreclaimed high wall. We have some other smaller uh, bankruptcies, but uh, those are the big ones. So approximately 400 permits or about 30% of our total inspectable units are involved in a bankruptcy in some way. This avalanche of bankruptcies has hit the division of mine reclamation and enforcement particularly hard. That's the division that inspects the surface areas of mines to determine whether the mining activity is in compliance with safety, health, and environmental regulations. One might think that because of the bankruptcies and fewer operating mines that the workload on that division would decrease, but that would be very wrong. No matter whether a mine is active, inactive, or abandoned, we still have to conduct inspections on about 1,400 permits or inspectable units every year on approximately 1.3 million acres. For active permits, we have to do one complete inspection each quarter and two partials. So last physical year, we conducted over 6,000 complete inspections and over 11,000 partials. As a result of the bankruptcy filings, additional inspection resources are required to monitor environmental compliance. What I've seen in my short time here is that the permits of bankrupt companies are often neglected because there's simply no one on site to keep up with the environmental issues. So there's no one there to dip ponds as they fill up. No one is on site to keep the dishes pulled and the roads are left to deteriorate. These problems have real world effects on the local citizens when the ponds overflow with sediment or when a hill uh, side gets saturated and causes a slide into a family's property. The Division of Reclamation and Enforcement has also been tasked with calculating the cost of reclaiming permits of those bankrupt companies. In the ideal scenario, a coal company reclaims the high wall it creates as it mines and keeps ponds and impoundments maintained. What we have unfortunately seen is that the bankrupt companies basically just stop reclamation as the bankruptcy occurs and the employees are laid off. The company's legal responsibility to reclaim doesn't end just because of the bankruptcy, but because of the competing creditors and even the cost of the bankruptcy itself, the company sometimes doesn't have the remaining resources to fully reclaim the mine site, including the high wall, ponds, and impoundments. Uh, the permits are secured by bonds that are used for reclamation when a mining company can't do so, but we'd like to make an estimate of the reclamation cost to see if the reclamation bond will cover that full reclamation cost, and if not, properly advise the bankruptcy court. Those calculations that the Division of Mine Reclamation and Enforcement does require substantial field work, including measuring high wall lengths, calculating spoil volumes, assessing reclamation required for slurry impoundments, sediment ponds, diversion ditches, and so on. The average reclamation cost estimate calculation for a permit requires about two days of field measurements and surveying, an additional two to three days of work by senior inspection and engineering staff. And all that additional work is on top of their approximately 850 inspections performed by the division each month as well as their work responding to citizens' requests for inspection, review and approval of pond removals, certifications, bond release applications, underground mine map reviews, and minor field revisions. Because of the lack of maintenance and personnel on most of these permits, issuance of enforcement actions has actually increased, resulting in larger workloads again for the staff responsible for the administration of permits and violations. In short, while the coal industry is in a hard times, the workload for the Division of Mine Reclamation and Enforcement is increasing greatly. Uh, the last topic I want to touch on about bankruptcy is about the, uh, how they've affected the Office of Legal Services. Those are our attorneys who would normally be representing the cabinet when companies contest violations. 
Now, this limited number of attorneys also has to represent the cabinet in so many difficult bankruptcies that it would challenge a good sized law firm. I have to say they're doing a great job, but they are dealing, dealing with a literal army of competing attorneys for the bankrupt companies, creditors, sure, uh, creditors, surety companies, and other government agencies. The, gut, the uh, department is dealing with an unusually heavily workload in a time of decreasing resources, but uh, I think all my uh, employees are performing admirably and professionally. Thank you, John. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Deb, if you could activate your camera and mic. Uh, with uh, the pandemic getting more people outdoors, as we've seen throughout the summer, how has your office dealt with the impacts to endangered species in our natural areas? Well, uh, it's been a challenge. Like uh, like everybody else, COVID has brought some issues that we hadn't really anticipated. Um, so we have about 140,000 acres conserved in our programs statewide. About 22,000 of those are state nature preserves that are actually owned by our agency. Uh, and all that sounds like a lot of land, but at 25 million acres in the state of Kentucky, you know, it's about half of a percent of land in our in our system. Um, and they're not really parks. They're, they're designed primarily for endangered species habitat protection and enhancement. We do have trails on them. Uh, we like folks to get out and hike around and enjoy them, enjoy the scenery, enjoy um, learning about through environmental education on these sites, but they're just not meant to be high traffic. And of course, early on in the spring, when folks were, were at home um, with the uh, travel restrictions and the shutdown, more and more people visited these sites and it did um, have a really severe impact on some of our areas that were close to major populated areas. So two things kind of happened. Um, a lot of our properties that were uh, partially owned by partners or managed by partners actually shut down in the spring. Um, some of them have not reopened and might not reopen for quite a while because they just couldn't handle the number of people uh, going to them. It was, the impacts were too great. Um, on our, our agency owned sites, uh, our trail crew has done an amazing job of keeping up um, with keeping them in good shape, um, making sure we have bridges that are in good shape and railings and things of that nature. Um, but, but it has been an impact, um, which is hard to keep up with. The main thing I would ask folks who, especially now that the fall weather's here and you're getting out into enjoying the leaves, is uh, just remember that the plants and the critters that live on these natural areas, it's their home, you're just visiting. Um, so tread lightly, stay on the trails. Uh, if you go somewhere and you see the parking lots full, that means the trails are full. That's the capacity. That's how the parking lots are designed in our natural areas. So you might need to find someplace else to go for the day to really take care of the places. So that's probably the major thing we ask folks to, to be aware of. Um, but you know some some good things have happened uh, as well um, so the heritage land conservation fund is one of our programs that's that's partially funded by the sale of nature's finest license plates that many of y'all have on your vehicles and we've actually been able to acquire some new natural areas um, during this this summer uh, we've worked with hancock county fiscal court to establish the jeffrey's cliff natural area we worked with WKU to add to their Green River Bio Reserve to, to buy an important area that will part, almost link the, the Green River Bio Reserve to Mammoth Cave National Park along the Green River, which is extremely important for rare species. Uh, most significantly, this happened right before the pandemic, actually. Um, a couple of, and Henry County donated, gave us about 300 acres to establish the Drennan Creek State Nature Preserve for rare species protection um, for the federally endangered species that we will restore on that site. So some good things have happened as well. But again, um, everything we do is focused really around rare species. A uh, couple of projects that we have going this summer to that end is we have uh, established a new partnership with the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet where our botanists are surveying roadside right of ways. We're going to do about 20 counties a year for five years. We've just finished our first year. We, our folks drove about 7,000 miles in those counties and located quite a few remnant natural areas for pollinator habitat. So we catalog rare species. KYTC will manage those roadside areas 
um, to benefit those pollinator plants and also reduce some of their maintenance costs. And the reason we're doing that is again, most of our state is not a conservation area. It is private property, things like right-of-ways. And if we're gonna protect uh, endangered species, we have to work on multiple sites, places like that. Um, this pollinator project specifically is to benefit really the monarch butterfly, which some of y'all probably are aware of. Population is not doing very well in North America. And so it potentially could be federally listed as threatened or endangered um, here within the next little bit. So we're doing what we can to work with partners to help make sure we maintain the habitat where we know they exist. And we're working at a, a big pollinator project at Perryville State Park um, to do the same thing, to increase habitat um, there as well for monarchs and other pollinator species. Um, another thing that we're working on is uh, when we get all this data from KYTC project, the pollinator project, as well as other projects, that goes into our database. Our database can be accessed by anyone Go into our cabinet website. We call it the KYBAT, the Kentucky Biological Assessment Tool, and help, it helps developers and other folks figure out what rare species are known from their project area and then avoid impacting them um, or, or um, actually could benefit them in some cases. We've just started a new project within the last couple months with the Office of Energy Policy where um, our data is going to be used to help work on uh, solar development and other renewable energy developments to again ensure that those developments are cited appropriately to not negatively impact rare species. And I guess the last thing I want to mention along those lines is uh, this is also our first year of a new project um, partially funded by the Natural Resource Conservation Service where if a Kentucky landowner applies for farm bill funding uh, for their land for a practice on their land to improve habitat they'll kind of get bonus points if their practice helps rare and endangered species. Uh, and it will guide them to do things that are appropriate. So it will actually benefit them to have rare species on their property. Uh, so that's something we're very excited about. Again, to protect Kentucky's rare and endangered species, it's not really about necessarily buying up the state, which we would not want to do, and we can't afford to do it anyway. It's to help those rare populations wherever they exist um, to thrive. Uh, I, I want to kind of uh, kind of piggyback on what both um, Gordon and Tony said is the only reason we're able to do this, uh, these projects and, and countless others is because we have an incredible staff. Uh, we have about 30 folks for a statewide program, which isn't very much. So we're always looking for ways uh, to be more efficient and to accomplish more and more and more we do that through partnerships with state and federal and nonprofit partners. And uh, we're, we're getting through this like everybody else by, by trying to be innovative and trying to do different things to accomplish our goals. Um, so we really couldn't do it without our employees and our great partners. So John, I think that pretty much answers it. Thank you, Director Weiss. Uh, Director Stump, uh, we've heard a lot, we heard a lot about our solar projects yesterday. What are the energy issues that uh, your office is focused on and some of the trends that you guys are seeing? Thanks, John. Um, I wanted to also uh, mimic what Zeb and Gordon and, and Tony said. Um, I'd like to thank all of my staff um, for enabling us to do what we do. We're an office of seven. Um, that spans looking at um, all types of energy related issues, not just electricity. Um, as you've heard from Ashley and Amanda, we're focused on affordability and um, energy assurance planning. Staff you may not be aware of are Greg Bone, who does all of our data and modeling work. And uh, we're doing more with less in terms of uh, making more of our data interactive and transparent uh, to increase the energy literacy across the Commonwealth. Uh, yesterday, the governor announced some Volkswagen uh, movement. Uh, Lona Brewer in our office heads up our uh, Volkswagen settlement agreement and uh, projects moving forward with that. Uh, we're excited about what's happening in our transportation sector and partnering with our automotive and, and freight uh, partners, looking at alternative fuel corridors, as well as um, our initiatives uh, around a zero emission vehicle infrastructure. 
Uh, we'll be moving that out in the next coming months, looking to expand our um, DC fast charging network and connect Kentucky to uh, the other surrounding uh, electri electrified corridors. We're also working with state parks and really excited about that uh, to expand level two charging into state parks and also with our um, local governments and uh, tourism locations. I did want to mention we are uh, working cooperatively and collaboratively with our Public Service Commission. Uh, we are monitoring um, policy issues at the federal level, and we are concerned lately of some recent actions FERC has taken, as well as some wholesale electricity market actions that are increasingly blurring the lines between federal and state regulatory oversight. Um, we're monitoring those um, along uh, with our Public Service Commission. I'm sure you're, you'll hear about that, but um, you know, we're, we're very supportive of our state regulatory oversight and we're increasingly seeing actions taken at the federal level that, uh, that kind of uh, impinge on that. And we're looking at it from the standpoint of how, does, how do those actions potentially adverse our, our most vulnerable populations. On our data side, uh, John, um, we are seeing continued industrial energy efficiency and uh, are looking to see how um, decreasing consumption in our industrial sector, how that's gonna affect the other sectors, uh, commercial and, and residential. We are excited, I mentioned yesterday, we have a great GIS project where we're evaluating uh, solar site suitability statewide and in particular as it relates to um, our mine scarred lands and uh, looking to see um, if we can identify potential uh, lands for, uh, uh, for projects. Uh, building on what Tom mentioned, solar is land intensive and if we can identify mine lands that are suitable um, as, as you know, not competing with our farmland or our green fields um, uh, working in, the, in that space. So it is challenging because you have to look at slope, uh, land cover, and um, you know, it's a challenging project, but we're, we'll look forward to those results in the, in the coming months. Um, other things we're working on, um, we're really uh, unpacking our low income energy affordability data and um, working to expand our work in that space and uh, potentially work to uh, develop a, a work group around energy affordability uh, so that we can really understand all the factors that play into that. Of course, we are continuing to work uh, with uh, Cabinet for Economic Development on all types of projects, uh, specifically though, um, potentially a renewable energy buyers work group with economic development, uh, along with uh, maybe some webinars relating to local government uh, and large solar projects building on Tom's uh, solar ordinance he spoke of. We are seeing new technologies emerging. We're monitoring, uh, uh, UK CAER's work with rare earths and um, some potential uh, electronics recycling as it relates to rare earths. We're also seeing some movement on green hydrogen and what does that mean for um, our automotive sector and trying to get our hands around uh, where hydrogen is going to play in our energy mix into the future. And um, always excited to look at our hydroelectric. We're seeing some repowering of our hydro, existing hydroelectric capacity. Uh, Louisville Gas and Electric recently completed some of that. And we're also seeing some new smaller hydroelectric come online as well. That's just a few things, John, our office is working on. Uh, if anybody has questions, I would encourage you to reach out to us. Also would like to mention Susie Paul in our office is behind the scenes who also kind of keeps us all together and running, all seven of us. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're here to answer questions and also talk about potential projects. 
Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a potential partnership with KGS, the Geological Survey. Uh, we're looking to explore industrial applications of geothermal, how it can support industrial facilities, as well as a potential project as it relates to uh, coal mine methane and how that can play into carbon offset projects as well. So that's about it for us, John. Thank you, Kenya. Larry, uh, please activate your mic and uh, camera. Uh, we, we know that environmental justice has been one of uh, EPA's missions uh, for many years. What's the cabinet's approach to environmental justice and how do brownfields play into that framework? Well, thank you, John. From a technical perspective, the cabinet began to incorporate some of the tools that are used to evaluate environmental justice probably as early as the 1990s. This included uh, broader use of geographic information systems or GIS, which allowed us to look at environmental issues, health outcomes, and community demographics spatially. Since then, we've also seen some improvements of other tools developed by EPA like EJ Screen, and that further advanced those capabilities. About the same time, the cabinet started to use a risk assessment-based approach which allowed us to evaluate potential exposures to sensitive subpopulations and consider the impact on the community. Cabinet started to use the, the term environmental justice a little more widely around 2005 or 2004 and became more actively involved in environmental justice. Uh, we've been participating in environmental justice efforts at the local, state, and national levels through specific permitting and agency actions attending conferences and training, collaborating with other states in the Southeast on environmental justice, and co-hosting an environmental justice workshop with EPA. Now, even though environmental justice has been part of our technical approach and environmental policy since at least 2005, we continue to look for opportunities to improve and advance our approach to environmental justice in our programs. So under Secretary Goodman's guidance and direction, the agency is placing an enhanced focus on implementing environmental justice considerations into our mission. In fact, yesterday we heard Governor Bashir and Secretary Goodman state the importance of protecting the most vulnerable and their commitment to environmental justice. This enhanced approach includes raising awareness of environmental justice both internally and externally. We want to make sure that our employees are aware and understand what environmental justice is and how it applies to what we do. Then making sure that it is a more visible part of our outreach and communication as a cabinet. Second, identifying and providing access to tools, tools that can be used for evaluating community demographics by our staff. They need to be equipped and make those, when they make those determinations and making sure that they know how to use those tools is vitally important. And those tools can also be used by the public and can be very helpful to them as well. The third element is identifying opportunities for community involvement. This is done by ensuring that data and the environmental information that we have is accessible so that the community can be aware of activities in their neighborhood. Along with that is enhancing opportunities for community engagement in environmental decision making, particularly when there are environmental justice concerns. And then finally, the cabinet wants to evaluate our programs and identify areas where we can incorporate environmental justice considerations into our processes. Now you mentioned brownfields. Brownfields plays a dual role in this process. First, by actually addressing these brownfields, which we've heard several times this week about um, properties that are abandoned or underutilized with real or perceived contamination. This may include corrective action and remediation, implementing site use plans and restrictive covenants to ensure that they meet the intended use of the site, such as residential, commercial, or industrial. Then another benefit is that it enhances the communities with revitalized properties that are no longer unused or underutilized. They may even be an eyesore and repurposes them to bring value back to our cities and counties, both aesthetically and economically. I'd refer you back to what Amanda talked about yesterday that Blight can breed more blight, and disinvestment can cause further disinvestment. But the opposite is also true. Sometimes it's that first step, that first project that can be the pebble that starts the landslide of change. 
For brownfields and communities with environmental justice concerns, it's important to work with both private and public partners to identify and bridge funding gaps that may exist. As Amanda discussed yesterday, some properties to the right of the bell curve often promote themselves and have a high rate of return on investment and are easy to address. They require little to no help to see redevelopment. It's our hope that we can help pull together the right players to facilitate redevelopment. We heard so several presentations during this conference already about the important partnerships that we have um, been establishing with the Economic Development Cabinet, nonprofits, and private interests to advance these efforts. Involving the members of the community in vision casting themselves and providing input on community needs is a very important part of this process. Yesterday, we heard about redevelopment of brownfields in West Louisville and the case study of the proposed biodigester. There were series of, series of listening quest sessions where they brought people together and listened to what the community wants, what do they need, and more importantly, what do they not want? In the end, they are now working on developing a sports and track facility that will bring in athletes and economic activity, and the community had a voice in those discussions. The elements that we've talked about and that I've described provide a foundation of how we address environmental justice in Kentucky, and we are continuing to evaluate how to meet our agency's mission to protect the environment and implement our environmental programs. I believe that you'll begin to notice some of these elements as we go through this process. Thank you, John. Thank you, Larry, and I uh, want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists. If you could quickly turn on your mics and cameras. Uh, I think we might have time for just a couple of quick questions. Carrie, I think you've been monitoring the questions. Uh, can we ask a couple, please? Yes, sir. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. The first question that we have is, do residential water filters show any degree of success at removing chemicals like PFAS? I'll, I'll take that. Um, <clears throat> potential carbon-based uh, um, water filters are potentially the most likely to be effective. PFOS is a very, it's a fairly large molecule, um, but certainly I think uh, taking efforts, if you can, to uh, either use a carbon or some other type of filter is, is certainly, couldn't be anything but advantageous. There's been a lot of research, a lot of discussions about how to properly uh, treat for this, uh, these particular contaminants, even on the large scale. And what uh, what has been found is uh, reverse osmosis could be a good process. It's not very widely implemented, but lots of carbon and the ability to regenerate carbon on a broad scale. So I can't, I'm not an expert on the issue, but I can't imagine that some type of filter wouldn't be advantageous to some degree. Carrie, let's take one more quick one. We're at the top of the hour. Thank you. The next one we have is, where can we learn more about projects that uh, Mr. Weiss mentioned regarding renewables and solar? That's probably a better question for Kenya. That's my favorite kind of answer. Yeah, <laughs> always love partnering with Zeb. Um, so um, we have some uh, interactive maps on our website. Um, we, uh, you'll see, um, in the next panel, I believe, um, a map that will show our um, merchant siding board solar projects, uh, as well as um, on our um, energy dashboard, we list all of our utility scale power plants, and we have projects in, in almost all of our regulated utilities um, that are uh, not just solar, but also um, I also am very proud of including our um, hydroelectric uh, operations in that. Um, we have hydroelectric operations that go back to 1925 um, and um, some of the largest in TBA's territory. And we can develop hydroelectric projects that are low impact now in some of our non-powered dams. And we're seeing some of those projects move forward as well. So I'd encourage you to look at our energy dashboard. We have our power plant maps and you'll be seeing a map of the um, uh, siding board projects, I believe in the PSC panel. And if there's not a map, we'll be happy to make a map for you. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. 
And one thing I will add is we're seeing more projects um, use our rare species information as part of their assessment package. In many cases, even if they're really not particularly required to, as in the case of state rare plants, things like that, um, it really sometimes takes minor adjustments to a project to benefit um, some of these species and habitats. And folks have been willing to do that in many cases. So we're happy to see our, our info included in these uh, packages. And to support Zeb's work, our um, utility scale solar projects, almost all of them have incorporated pollinator habitat. Uh, East Kentucky Power Cooperative has a has a great project. Uh, Aaron Patrick with Louisville Gas and Electrics expanding the pollinator sites down at E.W. Brown along with their, their uh, grazing operations. So we're very excited to work with our utilities on um, their land management practices and working with Zeb's group on how we can help increase pollinator habitat and uh, not just our electric utilities, uh, but our, our gas uh, utilities as well um, are working in the pollinator space. Thank you, Kenya. Thank you, Zeb. Uh, we better end it there in the interest of the next panel. As with all the other panels, we will forward the questions uh, that uh, remained and get those answered.